You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 1, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Basics of Allergy Skin Testing. Our presenter is Dr. Paul Dowling. He's a previous associate professor and program director in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital, and now he's retired to Park City, Utah. Welcome, everybody, to Conferences Online Allergy. Today is October 1st, 2021, and we are very happy um, to have our first lecturer back with us. Um, Dr. Paul Dowling uh, was one of our own as an associate professor in pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, and here as the fellowship program director in allergy and immunology for the past 25 years. Um, he recently retired and moved to Utah, um, where I grew up, so we are wishing him well in his retirement, but glad that he's back here with us. Um, Dr. Dowling was instrumental, along with Dr. Portnoy, in creating and maintaining this uh, COLA conferences online allergy program, um, and really Dr. Dowling's contributions to the education of allergy and immunology. Um, fellows here at Children's Mercy is is vast and really cannot be even talked about. So we are um, so grateful to have Dr. Dowling um, back here with us and turn the time over to you, Dr. Dowling. Well, thanks. That's a great introduction, Jordan. Thank you very much for those kind words. Um, this morning, um, we're going to talk about the basics of skin testing, um, not, not necessarily the um, um, most exciting topic, um, but it's one that um, you all need to know about. Um, okay, um, I don't have any disclosures, um, so we'll move on from that. Um, and this is a picture from yesterday morning from um, my um, uh, balcony off the front of the house, the deck. And um, the leaves are starting to turn here in Utah, and um, another beautiful day. So, as I said, peace and tranquility, which is good in retirement. Um, this is a, a quote from uh, Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook. We cannot change what we are not aware of, and once we are aware, we cannot help but change. So it's important that you um, know what's, what's um, correct and follow science, um, and, um, and and once you know the correct way of doing something, um, you should continue to do that and make sure that it continues that way. So, um, so hopefully there may be some things to learn today that you might not have known, and that will help you um, do a better job in caring for your patients while you're doing skin testing. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about history of skin testing. Um, back in 1865, um, Blakely um, first applied some grass pollen on a wet piece of lint on a piece on uh, some abraded skin, and he used a lance and a prick through it um, and got a reaction, a cutaneous reaction. Um, it was more traumatic um, and caused itching, and um, when they tried reproducing it, it had variable results, and there was also increased risk of systemic reaction by doing it in that method. As time went on, it was it was modified um, and um, they tried other testing with the intracutaneous test by Manto in 1908, and then Lewis and Grant first described the prick skin test a number of years later with a number of refinements after that. <clears throat> so let's talk about the mechanism of skin testing. Um, skin testing detects the presence of specific allergen IgE on mast cells. Um, the implication is that mast cells elsewhere in the body, such as in the nose, lungs, eye, and GI tract, would react similarly as you do to the mast cells in the skin. Um, and an allergen is put in contact with cutaneous mast cells. Binding of allergen occurs if mast cells on the skin um, have a coating, um, are coated with an Ig recognizing an antigen. <clears throat> Um, if both IgE and allergen are present in sufficient amount, then nearby IgE molecules against that antigen can cross-link, resulting in mast cell activation. 
and release of a number of mediators, the one that we think of most is histamine, and that's why we use antihistamines to block some of those reactions. Um, histamine is primarily responsible for the wheel or the bump that you have, the superficial edema, um, and the flare or the erythema, um, as well as mediators, mediators like prostaglandin D2. Um, something that we don't talk about very much anymore, um, but when I was a thought, we talked about a lot were early and late phase reactions. The late phase reactions are reactions that usually occur 48 hours, four to eight hours after the initial reaction, but may may occur up to 24 hours later. Um, and they can occur in people that initially have negative skin tests. This is um, cause of deep uh, uh, tissue swelling, redness, warmth, and itching, but they don't predict symptoms on exposure. So um, every once in a while, you'll have some patient that came to the clinic who had skin testing, who had nothing on skin tests, or maybe had a, a couple things, but then um, later that evening, you get a call that they had, you know, there's a bump at some place where there wasn't this morning or something, and that's a late phase reaction, and it doesn't predict um, symptoms on exposure, so it's not really important. So what are the indications for skin testing? Um, we use skin testing for a lot. Um, we take it for granted, but that's really what this, that helps distinguish us from other specialties. Um, and it's something that we have expertise at or should have expertise at. And we use it for a lot of different things that, um, again, during the, the course of a busy day in the allergy clinic, you kind of forget how, how important skin testing is for a lot of the diagnosis we make. So we use it to identify um, environmental exposures, um, uh, food, drug allergies, stinging insect allergies, and allergies to things like latex. Um, we use it to confirm sensitization to a particular antigen, and um, we can identify triggers for allergic asthma, rhinitis, um, and ocular symptoms as well. So indications for skin testing. So these are for non-diagnostic purposes. We just talked about diagnostic purposes. Um, but um, at an institution like Pillars Mercy, where um, not only do we um, have we done um, um, clinical work, there's also um, uh, research that goes on um, uh, that involves uh, um, looking at um, new drugs um, that may be coming out on the market um, or new ways of, of, of treating patients. And um, so we use skin testing for also for standardizing allergens for pharmacologic studies, for immunotherapy studies, and for epidemiologic studies. So what are the advantages of skin testing? Um, it's quick and simple to perform. Um, you can perform multiple allergens at a time. It's relatively inexpensive. It's highly sensitive. Um, and the, revolt, the results are available within 15 to 20 minutes compared to um, a few days or longer for in vitro testing. And it correlates with the results of mucosal, nasal, and bronchial challenges. So that's important to remember as well. So what are the disadvantages of skin testing? Um, well, if performed improperly, it leads to false negative and false positive results, which means you can either miss a diagnosis or overdiagnose someone. Um, so there's an importance of proper training of staff and periodic competency checks. A positive skin test doesn't necessarily mean people are allergic or will have symptoms. It only indicates sensitization. So that's one of the, the most important messages you could learn from today's talk is that skin testing, and just because you have a positive skin test doesn't mean you're allergic. Um, and the second year fellows, um, Don, Jordan, and Hannah um, heard me say that time and time again, and it probably, um, haunts them in their sleep uh, the number of times I said that to them, but it only indicates sensitization. The most important part of that is getting a good history. So you have to have not only a positive skin test, but you have to have a history that correlates with the exposure to that allergen that you have actual symptoms, and the two of those make a diagnosis of an allergy. Um, another disadvantage of skin tests is it can't be done if interfering drugs are, have been taken. The most common, common ones are antihistamines that we, that we use, but also things like tricyclic antidepressants have a strong antihistamine effect. Um, if someone's dramatic graphic, which, um, which occurs um, not infrequently, um, and that's one of the reasons we do a, a saline um, control um, to see if someone's dramatic graphic. 
And uh, if they have a significant skin disorder like severe eczema, they don't have any what I call virgin skin that you can, um, that's clear that you can do testing on. Um, you, the skin testing isn't going to be that helpful. Um, false positive skin tests may result in unnecessary elimination of food, drug, animals, etc. And false negative may miss a diagnosis and proper treatment. You certainly don't want to do that if someone's allergic to a food or a drug. So there's um, two types of immediate skin tests. There's the prick or puncture or epicutaneous, whatever you want to call it. And then there's also intradermal. Um, so let's talk about safety in skin test precautions. So um, we think of this as a relatively benign procedure. Um, however, um, there can be unexpected um, episodes, especially if you were doing um, intradermal skin testing. You have a higher risk of inducing anaphylaxis if someone is really allergic to that allergen. Um, and I've had patients um, who have been prick skin tested um, and have had anaphylaxis. Luckily, there's only been a couple times in my career that that happened, but it can happen. So um, don't become complacent just because you're doing, you know, kind of standard skin testing. Always be alert that something could go wrong. So never perform skin tests unless the physician is immediately available to treat systemic reactions. Again, this is more likely with intradermal. Have emergency equipment always available. Be careful with patients with recent allergic reactions. Determine the potency and stability of the allergen extracts used. Be sure uh, to test concentrations um, and make sure they're appropriate. Include a positive and negative control. So we use histamine as our positive control usually, and saline as our negative control. Um, perform on normal skin. Check for dermatographism. Um, and again, if there's that's something that is worthwhile asking a parent um, um, before you do skin testing, if the child has any evidence or signs of dermatographism, and often we'll take a, a tongue blade, or I used to use the, the blunt end of a, of a Q-tip and just um, make a, a small scratch on the forearm of the child um, and go back and look at it in a few minutes to see if they're reacting or not. Um, because if someone is significantly dermatographic, it makes it very difficult to try to interpret skin testing. Um, check medications used in timing before testing and record reactions at the appropriate time, which is usually 15 minutes. Um, if you are concerned that someone's been on a uh, medication that may interfere with skin testing and you're not sure how long they've been off it, you can just uh, place a histamine control first um, along with saline. Um, and histamine actually peaks within 8 to 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, you can decide if you can go ahead and do the rest of the skin testing if you have any concerns about that. Okay, let's talk about prick and puncture skin tests. Um, the, they detect an IgE reaction. The antigen is placed on the device and the epidermis is punctured or pricked with one of the variety of devices. Um, um, the at Children's Mercy, they use, I assume they still use the Dermapic, um, which has little prongs on the end and you dip them in a well and a drop of the allergen uh, adheres to those little pricks and then you just basically um, prick the skin. Um, this results in a wheel and flare, and again, prick skin testing is more specific. Um, Coralite is better than with, with clinical allergy than with uh, intradermal testing, and it's a safer test to do. So these are uh, uh, some of the different um, prick skin test uh, devices um, that have been used and are out there, um, and they're listed there, and you can see the, um, the Duramatic is on the the, the uh, bottom row on the right. Um, there's been a number of efforts to standardize skin testing. A number of different extracts are used in testing and, and from a variety of extract companies. Some allergens are standardized, many are not. There's different devices that are used for testing. Uh, people are much more mobile than they were 20 years ago, so it's, an, it's important that we have some kind of standardization. So if you have a patient who gets skin tested by you, but three years later their, their dad gets, um, gets a job in Boise and um, they have to move to Boise, Idaho, then um, uh, it'd be nice if Dr. Dr. Um, Stout's out there that he could interpret the skin testing and wouldn't have to redo the skin testing for that patient if he wanted to continue immunotherapy. 
Um, there have been efforts made by both the college and the academy and the practice parameters and the joint task force to encourage standardization and make it easier for patients and other allergists to understand skin testing. And if you go to the websites for both the college and the academy, and the ones I'm most familiar with is the academy, um, they have um, examples of skin testing forms and uh, lots of other different information um, related to trying to standardize the, the methods that we use. Um, so if someone takes a skin test sheet from one doctor to another, um, that's something that they can interpret. So skin test, it's a ski test, I guess I'm here in Utah too, too long. It should be skin test sheets um, that reflect allergens used, the manufacturer controls, criteria for positive reaction and grading should all be listed on the skin test sheet. And if you're at Children's Mercy, uh, this is um, one of the older skin tests, but you can see at the bottom, um, it lists um, the, um, the um, items that are mixes that we, what we use at Children's Mercy. Um, it lists the controls, um, it lists the, lists the manufacturer of the extracts, so you know what extract companies it come from, which are standardized, which are not. Um, it, it, it lists the data that was applied, how, um, who read it, um, who interpreted it, and then at the very bottom there, it tells you um, the skin, te skin tests were put on the back and mm -hmm. it into um, the device that's used, et cetera, and what the what positives can, is considered. So um, again, that's all important information to have on skin testing sheets. And if you work in the clinic long enough, you'll find that if you get records from other allergists, not everybody is um, is uh, as conscientious as having all that data. A lot of times there's very limited data. Sometimes there's not even the results of, the, of both the histamine and saline controls on the test, which makes it more difficult to figure out um, um, what the tests really show. So this is an example of someone who's had a number of skin tests put on their back skin testing. As you can see, um, there's the um, wheels and flares that are, you can obviously see there. So let's talk about the technique for um, prick skin testing. Um, you want to clean the back with, with a 70% alcohol solution, so using the alcohol pads that we have in the clinic um, are um, sufficient. Um, <clears throat> the, um, depending on how you're doing the, the, the uh, testing, some people will use drops and they'll have the allergen in a little dropper bottle. They'll have the patient lay on their belly, put the mark the skin, and then um, for the different extracts for, or different skin tests they're going to do, um, and then put a drop to correspond with that with that allergen, and then perk through that. Um, um, you can also do that. Um, um, most people do it on the back, but some people will do it on the the um, the forearm as well. Um, they usually are standardized at one to ten or one to twenty weight per volume. Um, use of one of the commercial devices. Um, uh, available that we just showed you a few minutes ago, um, are, are dipped, most of those are dipped into a well and they get a drop on the tip and you just prick with that. Um, the best way to do this is prick the skin at a 45 degree angle um, so you feel the pop of the skin. So if you're using like the, the German pick that's used at Children's Mercy, um, if, you, if you practice with that, you'll feel the, the, the little uh, prongs in the end, you can actually you can actually catch the edge of the skin in a sense. You can feel that little pop. Um, and sometimes you can even hear that pop. Um, but um, that's something that is important for the fellows to get experience at. And especially when you're starting your fellowship in the first few months, if things, if you have any quiet day or day that you're not in clinic or day there's not many patients, um, you should um, basically try to work with a, with a nurse who's doing skin testing and go in and observe, and then after a while, see if she'll let you do some of the skin tests and practice and practice and practice. Um, at some point um, um, during your first year, Dr. Miller and Dr. Algebron will be doing a skin test competency test um, with you all uh, procedure, and um, for you to um, pass your um, your fellowship training and be eligible for the boards. You have to be proficient in um, seven procedures, one of which is skin testing, um, and you'll have to go through a, a competency um, testing um, to be able to be signed off on that. So 
um, it's important that you um, do that and practice that. So especially at the beginning of your fellowship, this is a time um, to try to um, see as many and do as many as you can. Um, the test should be at least two centimeters apart to avoid overlap, because um, sometimes people are very reactive and you know, they'll, they'll mesh into, to, um, into each other, two allergens, and you can't really get an accurate reading for the allergens. Uh, we used um, histamine, as I mentioned before, um, 10 milligrams per mil uh, is a positive control, and our negative control is usually glycerinate and saline, um, similar to the bilirubins in the extracts. Uh, it's important that you ask patients about drugs taken and when, and also check for dermatographism, as I mentioned earlier. So what are the common errors in prick skin testing? Um, when the a skin tests are placed too close together, you have overlapping reactions, as I mentioned. Um, induction of bleeding can cause can lead to false positive results. Poor technique not sufficiently penetrating the skin can lead to false negative results. And this is more common with the plastic devices like the Dermapic. Um, an allergen can run during the test or spread when the allergen is wiped away. So you should be blotting it. So if you go in and you see an experienced nurse who's been doing skin testing for a while, if they have the child um, laying on their stomach on the exam table, after they use the Dermapic and, and do all the, the, the skin tests, place all the skin tests, they usually will take a couple of paper towels and place them flat on the, the patient's back and just press down to absorb any extra um, allergen that's there so it's not going to run while they're laying there waiting for the skin test to be read um, and going into another site that may confuse the picture and the results. And you don't want to wipe because if you wipe, you can smear some of that allergen onto another skin test site. Um, there's been a, um, a lot of studies done in the past about um, the different devices, and, and some of the devices um, um, are thought that you that um, you need um, more than three millimeters difference. Um, to show a difference between the control and the and the uh, a positive test, uh, for the most part, we usually think of a device that requires uh, three millimeter. That's three millimeters greater than your negative control is considered a positive test. Um, and uh, some of the devices are a little bit better than the others, as you can see on the um, um, on the on the uh, left side, the derma pick at the bottom that. Um, most of the negative controls were negative controls, so actually at a zero and three millimeters greater than that is sufficient. Um, some of the, some of the um, devices you need um, more than three millimeters of um, um, greater than a control to be really accurate. <clears throat> um, let's talk about interdermal. We don't do that much interdermal anymore. When I was a fellow, we were trained to do per skin testing and interdermal, and it used to be that um, um, but myself and Dr. Porno, who's on the, the call today, were fellows that you had prick skin testing done first, and the prick skin test was like a one plus or it was negative, then it was followed by an interdermal to whatever allergens that they didn't react to. Um, and the thought that, um, that the, um, um, the prick skin test was um, uh, more sensitive um, and the interdermal was more specific. Um, or vice versa, I guess. But um, anyways, um, the, um, the interdermal uh, skin testing was often used. As I mentioned earlier, there's a higher risk of anaphylaxis, and you would never put an interdermal skin test on someone who has a positive, a significantly positive per skin test, because you have a high risk of having an anaphylactic reaction. So if you're doing per, the interdermal skin testing is still done for um, drug um, testing, so if you're doing penicillin testing, for example, and the, um, the uh, pre-pen was, was uh, positive on the, on the prick skin test, you wouldn't do the interdermals. You would just stop at uh, that and not do the interdermal, um, again, because of the risk of, of anaphylaxis. Um, so in the interdermal skin test, the technique is different. You induce a small volume, 0.02 to 0.05 mils, basically enough um, to uh, create a bleb. Um, it's injected intracutaneously, um, and again, you only need enough to make a bleb. The interdermal testing is far more sensitive than per skin testing, 
but um, is usually not a significant benefit. And there's studies out there, maybe Dr. Nelson, when he talked about um, uh, um, immunotherapy uh, with you, I think last month or the month before, um, 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 talked about some of the studies that he did uh, where they looked at um, people that had basically um, limited positive on skin, um, prick skin testing, but only had positives on interdermal and, and that they really didn't benefit when they did a trial of immunotherapy for some of those people. Um, so, but we, when I, as I, again, when I was a fellow, everybody had interdermal uh, testing along with the prick skin test. Um, and now it, um, for the younger generation of people, um, younger than myself, um, it's more likely that you're going to do just for, for routine skin testing in the clinic, for for allergens and for um, for foods, you're going you're just going to do um, a prick skin test uh, in most cases. Um, the um, um, it also with the interdermal skin test requires about a thousandfold less concentrated extracts than those used for prick or puncture testing to achieve a similar result. Um, interdermal skin tests cannot use extracts in 50% glycerin as a diluent as it can cause a false positive irritant reaction. Um, and always perform a prick skin test first if significantly positive. There's no need for interdermal or um, in a higher risk for anaphylaxis. And there is, uh, for interdermal skin testing, there is a, um, a different histamine that is used than, than is used for um, prick skin testing. Okay, so common errors in intradermal skin testing. Um, if the test sites are too close together, um, just like with per skin testing, it can cause false positive reactions. If you put too much um, volume in the, is injected um, um, in the, um, into the skin, um, that can also um, cause problems. Um, and you only need enough to make the bleb. Um, if you put too much more, likely to bleed as well. Um, higher concentration of the allergen can lead to false positives. Um, splash reaction, when you try to inject too much and some of it splashes out, um, um, can cause air injection. And some cutaneous injection leads to false negative results if you go too deeply. Um, and too many tests performed at the same time can induce a systemic reaction. So let's talk about times when you went to skin testing. So um, um, skin testing is, is not routinely performed in patients who've experienced a recent anaphylactic event. Um, however, um, uh, Dr. Pitt, um, from some of his recent um, research that he's done, um, uh, may have some um, caveats to that, um, that statement. Um, and for those going to the, um, the uh, college meeting, they'll be able to see his abstract. Um, those um, taking medicines that may interfere um, with the treatment of anaphylaxis, um, so things like beta blockers and things like that are, are, are of concern. Um, the um, atopic dermatitis, again, if you have significant atopic dermatitis or significant dramatic graphism, People with chronic urticaria, um, if they're having urticaria that's coming up and going and is pretty much there most of the time, it'd be really difficult to know for certainty how much is from your skin test and how much is from the chronic urticaria. Someone who has mastocytosis, um, especially cutaneous mastocytosis, um, 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 I would be of concern as well with doing skin testing. And... Um, and patients who are at high risk for anaphylaxis, so people who are poorly controlled asthma and have reduced lung function, so if they were to have a bad reaction to skin testing, they're already compromised on their lung function, and that could um, cause more issues and make them um, get into trouble uh, fairly quickly. And people with history of severe reactions to minute amounts of allergen. So those are all things you, can, you need to keep into, um, take into consideration. Um, relative contraindications for skin testing are significant cardiovascular disease, including active and angina, cardiac arrhythmias, frail health and elderly, um, and people that are pregnant or women that are pregnant. Um, patients with these conditions or in the case of pregnancy, the fetus are at greater risk of adverse reactions from anaphylaxis, um, its treatment when it occurs. 
Um, there may be in, uh, situations where the benefits of the information gained from skin testing outweigh the risk, but again, it's something that you should um, um, consider um, uh, carefully before doing testing. Uh, some of the recent anaphylaxis within uh, the previous month um, has, has thought to, um, to a lot of people, is, especially if someone had classically that had been for um, stinging insects, that you, you wait uh, four to six weeks afterwards because theoretically if you've had anaphylaxis, you've lost all these mediators and have to reform um, and that your results may, um, may give you false negative results. But again, that's not always the case. Um, anaphylaxis can render the skin temporarily non-reactive. And again, um, um, if skin testing needs to be performed earlier than one month, um, positive results that people get are still useful. Um, and if rapid diagnosis is necessary, in vitro allergy testing is available and is less likely to be affected by recent anaphylaxis. And again, um, I think Dr. Um, Pitt's um, abstract that he's um, interesting uh, um, uh, out, or insights into um, doing skin testing within a month of having an allergic reaction. Um, this is just a big list of drugs that may inhibit skin testing and how long and you can look at this. The biggest ones that we are concerned about are, are um, antihistamines, the H1 antihistamines, um, and then things like, as I mentioned before, like tricyclic antidepressants, um, like, and like this is here, like imipramines. Um, and um, one thing that um, I wasn't aware of or forgot about was PUVA if someone's doing some, some dermatology um, therapy. So again, just kind of look at those and be aware of those when you're um, talking with patients and doing um, testing. Um, so factors that affect skin testing. Um, the area of the body is important. The middle and upper back is more reactive. The back is more reactive than the forearm. Um, and the endocubital area is more reactive than the wrist. Um, and some researchers disagree with this, but that's something you'll see in textbooks. Um, age um, can, be a, uh, can be a factor as well. Um, the, the skin reaction varies with age and positive tests to histamine and allergens um, after three months, but the wheel is, is often smaller. Uh, wheel increases in size from infancy to adulthood, but often declines after age 50. Um, when I was a fellow, I used to talk about um, doing um, skin testing um, to look for environmental allergens. Someone who's my age, who's in their in their 60s, um, wasn't very fruitful because when you get old, um, um, the skin tests aren't very helpful, and it's unusual for someone to develop new allergies at uh, you know, at that age. Um, and if you listen to the lecture that Dr. Um, Galen Marshall gave about um, asthma and allergies in the, in the elderly, um, you'll see that he often will do skin testing and often has um, significant benefit from, uh, for patients who um, have allergens and actually go on immunotherapy um, in their 60s and older. Um, there's no clear-cut difference between genders. Um, in race, large wheel response to histamine control and healthy non-atopic blacks versus Caucasian skin. Skin is always more, flare is always more difficult to see in darker pigmented skin, so that may can make it a little more difficult than interpreting and reading the skin test. Um, pathological conditions, eczema itself can diminish response to histamine, so may also be, that may also be seen in chronic renal failure, some cancer patients, and avoid testing around the skin lesion as well. And then um, common drugs that we talked about before. Um, grading of skin testing. So this is another um, um, area of a lot of, um, of uh, disagreement or different ways of doing things, I guess. Um, the reactivity to histamine, as I mentioned before, usually peaks in eight minutes. Usually allergens in 15 minutes, we usually put on skin test, and then 15 minutes later we'll go and read the results, and that's where we have the, the best um, wheel and flare at that point. The perfect skin test wheel should be at least three millimeters greater than your saline control, and a flare at least five millimeters greater. Um, um, and um, historically, um, results have been expressed as zero to four plus. 
um, uh, without expressing what size correlates with each grade. So you will get skin tests from doctors' offices um, where they did skin testing to cat or dog or ragweed, and they'll say uh, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus. Sometimes <laughs> they may have a, um, a uh, uh, bar, a, a box at the bottom of the, of the page that explains what 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus is. Oftentimes they don't. Um, and um, when I was a fellow, there were a couple of the attendings um, that um, did 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus. Um, uh, and, that, uh, and then we had other attendings that we measured the the um, the um, the length and the the width of the uh, wheel and flare both at 90 degree angles. So we had so you'd have a, a skin test. The wheel would be let's say three by eight, and the flare would be five by ten or whatever the measurements would be, and that would be recorded on our skin test sheet. Um, there are a lot of people that will do um, testing that they'll use the um, histamine, the positive, if you have a, a good histamine control, they will use that as a 3 plus. Something that's half the size of that um, would be a 2 plus, less than that would be a 1, one plus, and anything bigger than, a, than the histamine would be, or if they had um, um, pseudopods or satellite lesions would be, would be a 4 plus. Um, and it, it, there are a number of organizations like the Scandinavian Society of Allergology um, have recommended uh, skin testing be standardized based on the size of the histamine, intradermal, and, and, um, and the prick. The, um, again, on the bottom of the skin test, it says that a positive is um, greater than 3 millimeters, um, greater than your negative control, and you have to leave a 5 millimeter flare. And, um, um, and then people go beyond that. So um, uh, um, at Children's Mercy, they basically measure the wheel and the flare, and they use the largest um, diameter for measuring. So you'll have two numbers. So the, the wheel, let's say, the largest diameter is, is 8, and the flare is 15. So it will be listed as 815. Um, so, um, and again, like where I was a fellow, we used the, the, the method of measuring the longest diameter of the wheel and the flare, and then 90 degrees to that and measuring that um, uh, distance. Um, it's interesting that, um, you know, allergists will look at these pictures um, or look at skin tests and say, you know, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus. And I remember one of my attendings when I was a fellow who um, – would go into the exam room to look at the skin test, and he'd have the nurse there wanting to record his reading, and he'd go, 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 1 plus, 1, 2 plus, whatever. He just went zoom, 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 zoom through it, um, and he just thought that, you know, he was pretty good figuring that out, and that was good enough. Um, uh, there was a study by McCain and Ondi um, in which allergists were shown pictures of skin tests and asked to grade them, um, and they showed great vari variability um, and concluded it wasn't a... Um, um, wasn't a very reliable way of doing skin, of measuring skin testing or recording it. So they recommended doing measuring, actually measuring the wheel and the flare. Um, this is from, uh, taken from, I found from the 60s. This was um, different criteria that uh, people use for 1 plus, 2 plus, and negatives. Um, um, and that's uh, um, basically, um, uh, um, Again, there's a whole variety of things out there, but um, but I but historically, I think a lot of people have used three plus as being your histamine control if you have a good histamine, and then if it's much bigger than that, it's a four plus. Uh, if it's smaller than that, it's a it's a two plus, and if it's barely positive, then it's a one plus sort of thing. So again, there hasn't been great consistency on that. Um, interpretation of skin testing, positive reactions without clinical history. Um, 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 basically reflect sensitization versus a true allergy, false positive and negative uh, skin test. Um, um, you need to consider um, correlation with other diagnostic testing in vivo, such as the vivo testing. And the size of the skin test does not correlate with the severity of a possible reaction. Um, so 
only the the larger the skin test is only telling you that that person has a has a is more likely to have some sort of reaction if they get exposed to that allergen. It doesn't tell you anything about the severity of that reaction. So that's something to keep in mind. Another pearl to take away with you is that um, just because you have a large skin test, you may have pseudopods. Doesn't mean that you're, that makes you at high risk for having anaphylaxis. It just means that you're more likely to have some sort of reaction, be it a, be it a, a few hives or whatever, or some itching or full-blown anaphylaxis. Doesn't tell you the degree of, of um, severity. Um, I'm going to take the last few minutes and talk about methods of verifying proficiency because when you're doing skin testing, as I mentioned, there are a lot of things that you do every day in your practice um, that rely on um, skin testing and rely on the skin testing being accurate. Um, again, you don't want to miss someone who has a, a drug allergy or a food allergy that you have a false um, negative test. And by the same token, you don't want to diagnose someone with a food allergy who really doesn't have it that may have to carry an EpiPen the rest of their life. So um, it's very important that when we're doing skin testing that that procedure be done um, um, in the best method possible with quality standards to ensure accuracy. Um, so again, the devices vary greatly in size and, and, and the reaction and the likelihood of false positive reactions with different thresholds used for different devices. There's interoperative variation in technique. So every one of you, if you're doing um, a uh, perk skin test may have a different technique, um, and um, and especially if someone really hasn't been trained to do it properly, they can just you know dip it and, and think they're pricking it, and I think that's sufficient. Um, um, to ensure consistency, it's important that anyone doing skin testing undergo evaluation of their technique. Um, and it used to be um, um, a number of years ago when I was um, at Tolman's Mercy, we did um, a project for proficiency skin testing not only with the fellows, but we had the nurses do it um, usually once or once um, a year or every couple of years. Um, we would have all the nurses do skin testing on each other and um, to verify their proficiency. Um, and that's very important. A lot of um, private practices will do that um, on some regular frequency um, to make sure their staff is um, proficient in doing skin testing. Um, there's different standards that have been set. The most lenient set um, is the coefficient of variant being less than 30% between your skin test. Um, and watching skin testing being performed and doing a certain number of tests doesn't mean you're sufficient. So, you know, do one or C1, do one isn't, isn't adequate enough. Um, and just because you've seen a number of them, or even if you've done the number of them, doesn't mean that you're, you're doing them correctly. So it's important that you learn the technique and that, um, you have chance to practice it, um, and you keep up your skills. Um, these are some um, um, proficiency skin test um, testing um, recommendations. Uh, the one that we used at Children's Mercy when I was there was um, the guidelines that were put forth by um, John Oppenheimer and Helen Nelson uh, on skin testing, um, and um, they suggest proficiency testing and quality assurance technique for skin prick testing, and the condition of variance should be less than 30%. Um, and so <clears throat> um, I would assume Dr. Miller and Dr. Algebra would be doing this for the fellows at Children's Mercy. Um, but um, um, traditionally, we've done pro pro procedural competency workshops, um, usually in the, in the um, early in the first year of, a, of the fellows training after they had a, a chance to do a number of skin tests. Um, and uh, it offers hands-on experience for fellows and nurses. Um, and um, again, um, um, the um, nursing staff um, have done that in the past as well. It's important for fellows to know that uh, how to be proficient not only in the knowledge but the skills for inpatient consults and in practice. Um, because if you're going to do an inpatient consult, you may be taking skin testing materials with you and doing the skin test yourself in the in the hospital um, room and not have a nurse there doing that. Um, and actually in practice, um, if we've had fellows in the past who started their own practice, we had to actually teach the new nurses that they hired how to do skin testing and initially do the skin testing themselves for their patients. So again, that's important that you have that expertise. 
and it's required for you to graduate. Um, it's also ways of verifying skills on an annual or more frequent basis. Um, this is the procedural skin test competency workshop um, method that we have followed at Children's Mercy in the past. Um, and basically, um, the fellows would do skin testing on each other, either on the back or on the forearms. Um, and um, we use the Dermapec, and you clean off the back, and you perform um, 10 histamine and 10 saline, and you alternate them. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, you space them out adequately. Um, the histamines are read in eight minutes <clears throat> um, um, by outlining the wheel um, with a felt tip pen and then transferring with a tra with transparent tape to a blank piece of paper. Um, so you just basically overlap the tape on those those wheels that you, you outlined and then you lift that off the skin and place it on a piece of white um, copy paper and then you can use that to measure those wheels and flares. Um, Record saline results at 15 minutes by outlining the wheel and flare with a felt tip pen and transferring those results as well in paper. <clears throat> and then you calculate the mean diameter and you can go through the process here. And then um, you calculate the mean and the standard deviation for each mean wheel flare diameter, um, determine the coefficient of variance and the standard deviation and um, the quality standard should be less than 30% as mentioned. And your saline all negative control should be less than three millimeters of wheel. Um, and less than 10 millimeters of flare if you're doing an, an accurate um, uh, skin testing. Um, this is an example from one of the fellows back from about three or four years ago. And as you can see uh, on the left, there's um, saline and histamine um, that are spaced out. You can see the histamines light up there and the saline is really not doing anything. And then um, where they, um, the wheel and flare of the, of the reactions to the histamine are outlined, and then someone would come and put um, layer um, scotch tape over that, um, press it against the back, and then lift it up and transfer it to a um, white piece of paper so they can do accurate measurements from that. Um, also, um, as part of the proficiency testing, um, we have a competency checklist that um, are completed, and after the fellows do the skin testing, they meet with the examiner, like Dr. Miller and Dr. Algebron, and they will go through and ask all these questions um, to the fellow so that they understand the technique, the risk benefits, um, contraindications, et cetera, um, besides being able to do the testing, that they have knowledge of, of what the testing is for and how to use it properly. And um, that all together is used to verify um, your competency to be signed off on your procedure for skin testing um, so you can sit for your boards. Um, the importance of proficiency verification, it decreases the risk of false positive and false negative results, better diagnostic accuracy, avoidance of unnecessary therapies like allergen meal therapy or food avoidance, decrease risk of failure of properly treated, um, um, someone, a failure to properly treat someone, such as someone who really had a food allergy or drug allergy or um, needed emergency medications, decreased cost of unnecessary testing and therapy, and better all um, safer and more effective care for our patients. The, um, there's been um, some um, um, research done on, on frequency of uh, skin test proficiency, and there was a pilot uh, QI study, and I don't know if Dr. Luce saw this up or not, on the paper, uh, but she did have a letter to the editor um, in the annals of, about three years ago. Um, Dr. Liu is a, a program director in Tennessee, and um, they decided to look at their skin test proficiency, and they asked all staff, so they have all the nurses, all the staff attending physicians, and all the fellows um, did the uh, proficiency training as outlined above. and. Um, um, and they did them on the forearms instead of the back. And all, all the staff tested only seven of 20 met the criteria of proficiency on the first attempt. Um, the people that had more than four years of experience in the clinic showed less variation, included, concluded that there was an inverse relationship of experience and coefficient of variance, re, um, regardless of the operator, be it a physician or a nurse, um, and dedicating time um, sufficient time to guarantee reproducibility is important. 
recommended larger multi-center studies to identify the frequency of testing needed, and recommended proficiency testing with recertification, maybe quarterly, biannually, or yearly, especially in those with less than four years of skin testing. Um, so, um, in summary, um, immediate skin tests confirm sensitization to an allergen. Um, they don't, they don't uh, prove that someone is truly allergic. Immediate skin tests are simple, safe, reproducible, and sensitive. Interpretation of testing and identifying a true allergen relies on the history. So again, you need to have a good history that correlates with an allergen, an allergic reaction, and a positive test to be called an allergy. Proper skin tests can help in providing better diagnostic testing, safer care, and appropriate care for our patients. And the value of skin tests relies on proper technique and the person doing skin testing maintaining proficiency. Um, these are my references. And this is Nature at His Best. Um, the, on the left is a, um, a moose, a mother moose and her baby who were feeding in my backyard two nights ago. Um, they were probably about, I don't know, 20 feet from my back door. <laughs> um, and then uh, about a week ago, um, um, we, walked, we drove down the road here, probably about a quarter of a mile, and there's an open field, and there were just tons of elk all over. Um, this is just a part of the, the picture. It was, there were probably 20 to 30 elk that were all grazing in the field at, at dawn um, when we were driving down the road, and so I, I snapped a picture of that. So um, that's my, um, my natural life here in Utah, I guess. So uh, thank you for listening to this talk. Um, we have a few minutes for questions before your next lecture, and if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Thank you, Dr. Dowling. Um, we appreciate you being back here with us, even if it was just momentarily. Um, I'm monitoring the chat. If anybody has any questions, you can drop them there or unmute yourself and ask. Dr. D, I have a question, and we might have talked about this in the past already, but um, you know, usually the skin and the uh, blood tests will go, you know, be concordant, go hand in hand, but occasionally we see instances where negative skin tests, positive blood tests, or vice versa. Are you aware of any um, literature or any studies that have looked at that and kind of the best way to go about, um, you know, further evaluation? A lot of times we end up just either offering an oral challenge or continued avoidance depending on what the history is, but are you, do you know if anyone's done any studies looking at discordant skin and blood testing? I, I, I don't know. Um, personally, I can't think of any, per se, any large studies or anything. Um, Dr. Porter, if you saw on the call, may, um, um, may know some because he's um, involved with the, had been involved with the practice parameter for a number of years and um, goes through a lot of that data. But um, the, um, as we talked about in the clinic when I used to be there, there um, uh, over the last, for some reason, it seemed like over the last two or three years, I was I was seeing more discordance between the skin test and the and the um, and the blood test. Um, if you have, um, I think what you end up doing if you if you have someone who comes in who you have thinks has a uh, a significant history for an allergen, let's say the to dog or whatever, and you do the proper skin test, and it's done properly and everything's fine, and it comes back negative, but they have this really convincing history, then I would probably follow it up with a blood test. Um, if the blood test is negative, then I'd probably say you're not allergic to dog. Um, if the blood test is positive and they have that convincing history, then you'd probably say, well, I got a history, I got a positive test, at least one of the tests positive, um, and they have symptoms, I would I had to treat the, the person um, and uh, for that. Now, it gets a little more sticky if you have someone who has um, uh, food testing, I mean, it's food allergy, and they have a significant history of having a bad reaction to, let's say, peanut or something, um, but you're, um, and you've done the test correctly and it's been sufficient time, et cetera, and the skin test comes back negative, um, and um, 
the um, blood test uh, may come back positive or negative. Um, if the blood test comes back um, positive, then you said, well, we got something, we got a convincing history, got a test, I'd be avoiding peanut. Um, but there are instances where the skin test and the blood test will both be negative um, when you have a convincing history. And those are people that you're more likely to go about and, um, and consider doing an oral challenge depending on how, how significant the reaction was. It was someone that um, had, uh, you know, full-blown anaphylaxis. The only thing they ate was peanut. And your skin tests, your blood tests were both negative and they were sufficient period of time after the, the anaphylaxis, et cetera. Um, and um, they were both negative. Um, you might be a little leery about doing an oral challenge. And sometimes you may just say, okay, for the time being, we're going to say that you're allergic because of the significant history. And then maybe in six months, we'll try testing again or something and seeing what happens. But the thing you have to remember is that, um, that skin testing, even if someone's allergic, skin testing and blood testing, there's five to 10 percent of those times that the skin test or the blood test may not pick up the, a positive reaction. Um, so that's something you have to keep in mind. And again, you get complacent thinking that, you know, all these tests are going to give me some answers, um, but they're not, but they're not foolproof. And so that's something just to keep in mind that there's a percent of people, even when they're significantly allergic, they're, that will have a negative uh, skin test or a negative blood test. So, um, and then um, the same thing is we've talked about in the past for for um, for um, foods. Normally, we would follow um, the blood test to see if someone uh, could do an oral challenge to a food if they're losing their allergen. But if their if their blood test is negative to begin with, and their skin test is positive, or their blood test is is barely positive, it's really not anything you can follow to decide if someone's that you know could have an oral challenge down the road. And so in those cases, I mean, more likely to um, repeat skin testing, even though it still can stay positive, it should significantly get less if they're losing their allergen. So um, I don't know if that helped you at all, but um, um, that's my that's my message. Um, and I, I would ask <clears throat> Dr. Porno, if he's not on the call still, so, um, I would ask him if he knows an because he's pretty good at knowing all that, that information. Um, having worked in practice parameters, so. No, it's not a matter of practice parameters. It's a matter of understanding the fact that skin testing and blood testing are both diagnostic tests. So you have to use them as such. They don't give you a yes or no answer. What they do is they take your pretest probability, how strongly you believe that a patient is having allergy reactions, and they convert it to a post-test probability. Each test is associated with a likelihood ratio that either increases or decreases the probability that the patient actually has clinical allergy. And so you have to use it in that context. You can't say that the test is it proves yes or no. It, it just increases or decreases the likelihood. Chair, are you aware of any um, articles, though, that Sean asked about that um, look at the discordance between skin testing and in vitro testing? Um, um, you know what the what that percent is because when when um, when in vitro testing um, the test that we use now got approved a number of years ago we did as you recall we did um, some of those um, some of that research where we did patients had skin testing in the clinic and then we sent them to the lab to have blood tests under the same thing and they used that data and they said they correlate uh, pretty well and that's why that testing got approved um, so um, but. Has there been anything more recently that has looked at any of the correlations? It was of greater interest to researchers in the past. More recently, it's not being done as much, so I can't point to any recent papers, but I know in the past there were a number of studies that compared the two, and they show a correlation, but they don't tell you how frequently one test accurately identified somebody with allergy or with allergy, a po without allergy, a positive test doesn't mean you're allergic. It just means that there's an increased likelihood that you could be allergic. Uh, I would refer you to Gendo. He did a study uh, on rhinitis where he looked, developed likelihood ratios both for blood tests and for skin tests. And I keep that paper on my, um, on my server ready to send out to anybody who wants it because it's something I cite all the time. Um, the thing is you need a 
gold standard. You need to know whether the patient actually is allergic or not in order to determine how well the test has performed. <laughs> Well, um, it's 10 o'clock and you have another lecture coming up, so I won't keep you guys any longer. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you guys and to reminisce with former fellows and former colleagues. So I appreciate you letting me talk this morning and um, you all have a great weekend, okay? Thanks, Dr. D. We miss hey. you and it was nice to hear your voice. Hey, Hannah. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping you're out of Sounds wonderful. Okay. Um, um, Jordan, if you get this way, um, if you're going to be coming this way at some point, um, let me know because if I'm around, maybe we can um, have you come up to the mountain. I'd love that. Thanks, Dr. D. Okay. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye.